Good morning, I'm Joe Acker and I'm the Director of Clinical and Professional Practice. Over the next few minutes, we'll give you an update on what's happening with paramedic practice in British Columbia. Good morning, my name is Ole Olson and I'm a paramedic practice leader here in Vancouver. And I would like to welcome you to the BCEHS Analgesia Update as part of your continuing professional development day. Let's start by talking about the exciting future of paramedic practice at BCEHS. Over the last several months, we've been working closely with the EMALB to discuss regulatory changes that will enhance the scope of practice for all license levels in BC. This will not only give paramedics the opportunity to use new skills, medications, and interventions, but more importantly, it will enhance this, the scope of practice to allow us to assess, see, treat, and refer patients in the community and provide better care to palliative care patients. It's important to appreciate that paramedic practice is not just skills, medications, and interventions. It's a holistic approach to our practice. Things that include documenting the patient experience, attention to detail when it comes to administration and data collection, as well as accountability to ensure we're providing the best and safest patient care possible. Oli will be discussing a number of exciting interventions that we have trialed, have implemented, or plan to implement in the near future at BCAHS to give paramedics the tools and ability to manage pain better in the field. With this responsibility, comes the need to ensure our documentation is excellent, as well as adherence to CTS, or Controlled and Targeted Substances, requirements under legislation. I'll talk more about those at the end of this presentation. Now, before we really get going, I want to provide a little bit of background on this topic. Addressing and managing a patient's pain is one of the most significant contributions a paramedic can make, and in fact, it's a cornerstone of the care that we deliver in the pre-hospital setting. It's also important to remember that each intervention and medication has important side effects. Some of these side effects may actually even worsen a patient's pain or experience. It's important that we take a progressive staged approach to all of our care, including pain. Now today we're going to talk about a few new considerations. Methoxyfluorine or Penthrox, as you may have heard about, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, IN ketamine, and for the ACP community, the addition of fentanyl and ketamine to their scope of practice. Now here's an opportunity for all of you to bring out your phones in class and actually bring up the BCEHS handbook. We're not going to get into specific indications and contraindications, but if you follow along in the pain treatment guidelines, you'll be able to reference all of these. It's also important to remember basics first. Always use a stepwise approach in controlling pain. The basics matter. Simple things like Reassurance, gentle handling, control of temperature. It's amazing what a warm blanket will do for a patient in any situation. Positioning the patient's limbs appropriately, splinting in the application of cold dressings for burns. Move from simplest to most invasive. Never neglect the basics in favor of more complicated approaches. It's also important to remember that your demeanor and language are also an important part of pain control. A calm, empathetic, and caring manner will always enhance any intervention. Even opioid narcotics are not going to work if you tell a patient that they're not going to. And remember, Antinox is an effective analgesic, especially when combined with reassurance and positive reinforcement. Now, let's talk about Penthrox. Penthrox or methoxyfluorine is a volatile self-administered analgesic indicated for short-term pain relief. We know that it works really well for controlling pain. This has been demonstrated around the world and other jurisdictions for over 20 years. What we don't know is how well we can deploy it in our setting here in British Columbia. So we thought to explore this by starting the Penthox trial in late 2018. Phase one is now complete. And this project aimed to analyze the logistical training and total cost implications of a staged rollout of Penthrox in some select stations. We chose 12 stations around the province, and the stations we chose were based on basically rural geography and uh, proximity to ski hills. Now, the initial phase of the project has now been complete, and we're at the point where we're analyzing all of the data that we've developed, user experience, total costs. We want to do a continued cost effectiveness evaluation and compare this to all of our other analgesic options. There are major cost implications with the rollout of Penthrox. We have to be sure that we can justify it if we take this next step. Great news is, is that we found the feedback from the trial paramedics was overwhelming, overwhelmingly supportive. Uh, they found it very effective. They found it easy to use. 
and they found that the resource material and training provided was excellent. Ibuprofen or Advil is also being considered as well. So it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, it's great for soft tissue injuries, sprains, strains, arthritis, headaches. We're at the phase now where we're looking for procurement and budgetary approval, and this is ongoing and pending shortly. Ibuprofen will be rolled out, rolled out hopefully with acetaminophen or Tylenol, another drug that you're all very, very familiar with. One of the great things about acetaminophen is that when combined with ibuprofen, it has a synergistic analgesic effect. Again, we're uh, in the process of procurement and budgetary approval, which is ongoing. Intranasal ketamine. So intranasal ketamine has been rolled out in a couple of stations throughout the province. The PCPs in Prince Rupert and Fort St. John are now using intranasal ketamine and they're having great experiences with it. Uh, ketamine does have some great uh, analgesic properties and fortunately when delivered with a nasal atomizer, it's uh, very effective. The great news is, is that EMALB considers this an inhaled analgesic, which is well within the scope of practice for primary care paramedics. So this has been approved, but at this point only in select locations. Now fentanyl is being rolled out to replace morphine for advanced care paramedics throughout the province. The training is ro being rolled out through the AIM-3 training program, and it's an excellent pain control medication. It's very fast acting and effective. With the AIM-3 training, we are also rolling out ketamine, um, for the ACP community as well. This will be used in procedural sedation and induction prior to intubation by the advanced care paramedics once they complete the AIM training. Uh, midazolam will still be on board for seizure, seizure control as well. Thanks Oli for providing the excellent overview of the analgesic options we're considering and implementing at BCEHS. I want to take this opportunity to remind paramedics of the importance of documenting comprehensively and accurately your patient care experience. It's really important when dealing with pain management that you document the history of chief complaint and the mechanism of injury. We often don't see the pre-analgesia pain score on our patient care records, so please remember to do that. If you've done anything else to reduce the pain, like Oli mentioned, elevating the extremity, splinting, or provide a, a cold pack, make sure you mention that as well. When you've given an analgesia, like always, identify the time, the route, and the dose. Again, reminding everybody, please, please, please remember to put in a post-analgesia pain score, another really important indicator that helps us identify whether the medications that we're using are actually working for our patients. If you've identified any complications, side effects, or adverse reactions, please put those in the patient care record. And if they're severe, make sure you file a PSLS form as well. Any additional analgesia that are required to reduce the patient's pain, make sure you're using those as well and putting them on the patient care record. We of course want to go from most basic interventions, like splinting, to more advanced interventions as necessary, but not just dumping, jumping to the biggest one uh, right off the bat. And if we're using controlled and targeted substances, you need to document your wastage and the counter signature. Now this brings us to a conversation about controlled and targeted substances. Medications like morphine, fentanyl, midazolam, and ketamine are CTS agents and require specific storage and documentation requirements under national law. This is why at BCHS we use biometric safes to store these medications, we have them behind two locked doors, we require wastage documented in the electronic patient care record, and we do daily logs to ensure accountability of these medications. Methoxyfluorine is not a CTS, but it is a high alert medication that we want to monitor, control, and track. Paramedics are required, therefore, to be compliant with CTS procedures when using methoxyfluorine. There is a new BCHS medication management code of practice under development and a new CTS register coming into effect shortly. You'll all be trained in this as it comes into effect, and this will help ensure that BCHS is compliant with all legal and accreditation requirements. If you want more information about controlled and targeted substances, and also to review our Section 56 exemption for ACPs, CCPs, PCPs, and ITTs, you can check it out on the Government of Canada website. Specifically, you can see that paramedics are required to follow this act, and it's really, really important that we ensure that we are adherent to all laws, all regulations, and all policies and procedures when it comes to CTS drug use. 
I know that some of you in the education session today will be frustrated to hear that intranasal ketamine, methoxyfluorine, and some of the other agents aren't coming to your stations quick enough, and we understand this. Unfortunately, we have a lot of things to ensure before we can put CTS medications in every station across the province. This is really important because if we don't do this well, if we don't monitor the medications and track them well, we're at risk of losing our Section 56 exemption for our whole organization. And what that would mean is that no paramedic at any license level could carry any of the CTS agents. So that's why we're going slowly and confidently to ensure that we're doing everything appropriately to not only maintain patient safety, but also ensuring low risk to the paramedics and really importantly, low risk to the organization. So if you have any more questions about the CTS or Section 56 exemptions, feel free to email us at the clinical practice email that Oli will share with you at the end of this presentation. So in summary, um, advancing the analgesic options for all paramedics across the province is an important goal for all of us in clinical and medical programs and BC Emergency Health Services. However, it's not a simple quick fix. All the factors have to be considered when taking these next steps, including cost effectiveness and procurement. It's just not as flicking a switch and having these medications arrive at everybody's station. So you may be receiving patients with these agents on board. And as we roll this out, uh, it may be in the staged approach in different stations, uh, in different locations throughout the province. You may be receiving a patient at the airport that a PCP crew from Fort St. John has delivered IN ketamine to on the way down. It's perfectly acceptable for you to take this patient and bring him into the hospital. You may be dealing with some of our partner agencies, uh, search and rescue, or Ski Hill where they've administered Penthrox to a patient. It's perfectly okay for you to take this patient in the back of your ambu ambulance with the inhaler to the hospital. I just want to finish by thanking you for your time and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Now if you have any questions you can always reach out to the paramedic practice leaders at clinicalpractice at bcehs.ca. We're very responsive to this and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So again, thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.